Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody's having a great January coming towards the end of the month. As my, like, what am I saying? It's the last day of January, isn't it? Well, let's go ahead and get this party started. My name is Michael Crean, and I'm the CEO and founder of Solutions Granted. We've got Corey Clark with us. Um, he is our vice president of threat operations, the mastermind behind our SOC and all of the things that go on and hit bump in the night. And we've got Will Alexander, our VP of security operations. So this is our first webinar of 2023. You know, we are doing a little bit of forecasting here as to what we think we see in the crystal ball, what it's going to take for MSPs to be successful as the threat landscape is ever evolving and changing. And we hope you'll learn a little bit about new features that we've added, new functionality that we're bringing forward to some of our existing technologies and what's on the roadmap and just where we're going to be this year. So let's go ahead and get it started. Threat landscape in 2023. Corey, let's talk a little bit about why we're talking about exchange servers and why we call this the remaining low-hanging fruit. Vulnerabilities are constantly going to be coming out, right? We saw it in 2021. That's really where it took a head, where things really started, in my opinion, uh, with adversaries leveraging the vulnerabilities across of it, and they've been running with it. So whether we're talking about half neum that happened in March, proxy cell that happened later in the year, then proxy not shell came out, and then, I mean, there were even more vulnerabilities as recent as, you know, zero days as recent as December of 2022. So it's not going to go away. Um, you know, yep. your customers are reluctant on getting rid of on-prem exchange and do not want to go to 365. I mean, you need to account for this and you need to patching these servers. We're still actively, if we can tell you have an on-prem exchange server and you're on our MDR offering, we are still scanning for agent versions and we're reaching out to partners when we see that you haven't patched in like six months. Um, we found a trend where we alert our partners on, hey, there's this huge vulnerability or, hey, you've been hit with this and they're patching for right then and there, but then they forget about it. Um, a lot of reasonings we're getting from our partners is it's a mission critical server. Our customers don't let us reboot the server. Our customers don't let us touch it, right? Or, hey, this isn't under my management. I've heard that, right? You're, you have everything else in the environment except for the servers. Well, when they get hit with something, in the end, it's going to end up coming on you anyways. Um, so that's why, you know, you really have to account for exchange servers and just constantly be evaluating them, patching them, and making sure that the proper agents are on there. You know, Corey, here's my fear of what's happening here is that because this has been so out there it's in the news we're talking about it lots of other people are talking about it you know it happens these big hits and it creates these news cycles but we're talking about one particular function that microsoft puts into a server with exchange and as we have found so many of our partners because their customers aren't allowing them the arm tools are failing the patching isn't getting done properly you know, so I want to make sure that you guys remember that, you know, even when you have a SOC, even when you have an MDR, even when you have threat hunters, when you have what you may want to consider the best EDR out there, there are basic principles of responsibility that have to be done by everybody to be this collaborative team. And that includes patch management, because at the end of the day, and I hate saying it this way, but I don't really have a better way of saying it, is if you set us up to fail we will definitely fail. If you do everything in your power to be as successful as you can, it creates a better level of success for us to be able to take care of you and take care of your customers. So, you know, it isn't just about the exchange servers that we're picking on. We're picking on just patch management in general. This just happens to be, as Corey called it, the low-hanging fruit. So moving on to phishing. You know, we've got the spear fishing, we've got the smishing, we've got the vishing, we've got the farming. I mean, I don't even know what farming means, but I, it's a new one for me. Yeah, or what, what in the hell does farming mean? Farming means they're actually putting the payload within the email. So instead of just okay. trying to trick the end user, they're just, they're going to put malicious code in the email. You open up the email, boom, you're hit. Got it. Um, you know, we were even hit with smishing, you know, SMS phishing last we year. Sure were. Where someone, because of me. Well, kind of because of me. <laughs> so they were impersonating Michael, 
somehow they got a bunch of our company cell phone numbers and they were texting and saying, Hey, this is, you know, this is Michael. I need you to go get it. Was it a Nike gift card that they asked? I, I don't remember. It was some sort of gift cards, but it was, I don't know. It was at least four or five employees got the text message saying it was me. It wasn't coming from my phone number. So it wasn't as sophisticated as it could have been. Like they weren't spoofing my number, um, but they were sending it. And, you know, thankfully I will say that, you know, I started getting text messages. Hey boss, did you just send me this? Or, you know, I forget who it was, but somebody started playing along with them and started kind of stringing them along and kept going back and forth with them because they obviously knew that it was fake. And so they were trying to you know, play the game. So it's, it's getting far more aggressive and you have to make sure that you're doing the right things to give a better defense, but also make sure you give really good education you know, share the stories that are being shared with you. Tell them, you know, look, I know somebody that their employees were getting text messages pretending to be the boss. Because um, sometimes people think it'll never happen to me. I'm too small or, you know, how would they ever get that information? Don't know how they got it, but they absolutely did. So why are we back to talking about Emotet again? Because it's, it's, it's ramping back up. It never goes away at least once a year. There's a new campaign around it. Uh, the crazy thing about Emotet is it's so successful. And what it does is it leverages and gives command and control once it's in an environment to all the machines. And they utilize that to start dropping stuff like Cobalt Strike. Ryuk is going to, it's coming back. We've already detected our first one on this one this year uh, where we found some Ryuk files. So we have to ensure that we have the right strategy in place, right? Anti-phishing, it usually starts with phishing, like most things do. Uh, then script control is so, so important to block these malicious scripts. You need to account for where people are running macros from. Don't just let your customers run macros freely, right? Because <laughs> that's where most of these are coming from. And then, you know, consider compensating controls in an environment. Because antivirus is not enough. You know, how many times yeah. I get questions, well, hey, this just came out. Well, will Silence stop this? Right. Or uh, the, the latest thing I'm getting a lot of emails on is the, was it CISA report that came out that people are deploying RMM tools, malicious RMM tools into environments. And I'm getting the same question. Hey, does Silence stop this? Your antivirus isn't going to stop it. No. Because um, I've had a lot of these conversations with a lot of different companies and antiviruses, no matter who you're using, don't block common tools. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're not blocking and pain of my existence, PS exec. They're not blocking PA exec. They're not going to block your Datto, ConnectWise, uh, Ninja, right? They're not going to block all of these different install files. And they do that because one, they're getting pressure from the manufacturers too, because uh, that everyone will, <laughs> so many people will complain and leave because of how many false positives are in their system. Um, so no, antivirus won't stop that. And so you have to, again, going back to compensating controls, you have to look at the bigger picture, look at what's stopping it. Even CISA points out what you need to do. One, focus on phishing. Two, hey, here's these known bad websites. So when these articles come out and they say, hey, these are the known bad websites that we're identifying with these attacks, lock them on your firewall. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about a little bit about the under the insurance underwriting. Um, you know, this was a really big topic of discussion. We heard lots of MSPs that were struggling last year with insurance, with the rates going up significantly, clients having problems. I mean, look, this is the same thing. The house always wins. The insurance companies have been losing for a long time because the actuaries didn't have a clue what they were underwriting when they started selling cybersecurity insurance they have had time to get smart and they know what they're doing now and they are raising the stakes. You know, it was getting to the point where they were just saying, check some of these boxes and tell us. And one of them was, do you have EDR? Well, they're now going far beyond that. And they're saying, do you have a managed EDR with a SOC? To me, that just screams MDR. Like how can you say you have EDR without a SOC? This insurance game is just, it's getting harder and harder. Um, even had a client on the phone, an MSP on the phone the other day that said they were having, they had an incident. And I asked him, I was like, okay, so 
do they have cybersecurity insurance? Do they have legal counsel asking a couple of questions? And the first one is they don't have it. And they were like a monster company. We're talking like a billion dollar revenue company. And I was just shocked. It's like, why? It's like they felt that they could self-insure themselves in way and just put the money in the bank to make it possible. Um, so yeah, that's uh, it's what some people are doing. They're choosing to self-insure because the insurance game is becoming just too difficult. Uh, let's see. How about Fortinet Firewall's ability to block malicious websites? Do they do a decent job with their default projections? I don't know. We don't have a whole lot of experience. My concern would be is that if it's an encrypted site and you can't see the payload that's happening in there, then you're screwed. There's nothing you're going to be able to do that. So you'd have to have some sort of DPI inspection enabled. Let's talk about cloud takeover at the moment. Um, lack of MFA, 2FA, lack of conditional access. I mean, Corey, if, if you look at like all of the compromises that we saw or the events or the, you know, not going to say the B word, we're going to stay away from that because, you know, we all shouldn't say that for certain reasons. Um, what percentage would you give as a leading attributing factor to the lack of MFA or 2FA and conditional access? I'd say around 80%. Now, some of our partners claim that 2FA is in place, but when we pull the report and we see that it's not 2FA, it's one of those oh type moments. <laughs> um, but majority of them, again, are the lack of 2FA because again, 2FA is not the catch all be all. I know someone, if there was chat on here, would say it's not going to stop everything. I agree, 2FA doesn't stop everything, but it creates a very large hurdle. If my SOC analysts see a potential account takeover, right, where they see a failure coming from China and the you know conditional access rule was hit or 2FA failed, that's an indicator to us that, hey, they have the username and password. So before this becomes a bigger issue, boom, let's get in there and let's change the password. Let's make sure there's all these other uh, controls in place to make sure that obviously this account's being targeted or there's some information out there on the dark web about it that we keep this end user safe. And I would say, I know that, you know, we're hearing that it's getting better, that it's getting easier, that MSPs are standing more of the ground and drawing the line in the sand and saying, hey, look, this is the way it is. You have to do it. We can't support you if you're not doing it, but there's still a lot of it. I mean, it was, you know, at RSA in 2022, some unridiculous amount of every month, Microsoft says a million plus accounts are compromised and 99.3% of them have no MFA. I mean, so we're still seeing this is a very rampant problem. You know, does it fix everything? No, but why make it easy for them to take business email compromise to then move their way laterally through the environment and do whatever it is that they want to do? So don't give your clients an option, make them do it. You know, it's almost, it's almost like making your kids eat vegetables. Don't care if you don't like it. Don't care if you tell me that you don't have any more room, but all of a sudden you're asking for ice cream. We know vegetables are good for us. We make our kids eat them for a certain reason. Make MFA like vegetables. You have to do it. So just stomach it and get it out of the way. And when it becomes a part of your everyday life, it no longer becomes a problem. I mean, as you said earlier, insurers are going to make it real easy for us, for all the MSPs, because it's going to end up forcing your customers to use it anyways. If yep. they want insurance, they're going to have to use it. So I, I applaud insurers for that and making it easier for us because it's, it's that necessary evil. You know, I always, if you're on a phone with me and I get slowed down because of 2FA, I have my running joke. It's like, I feel like everything now in my life requires 2FA. I can't use the restroom without putting a 2FA code <laughs> in, right? I can't do anything without putting a 2FA code in. And it's one of those necessary evils, you know? I, I, I can't say I necessarily enjoy wearing a seatbelt, but I wear it every single time I drive my car. Because I know how I drive, right? And, and I know I'll it tell can you, the save MFA has just been pissing me off lately. I go home, I get on my computer, and I got an MFA in. I start my RDP session, and I got an MFA. I hit my computer in the office, and I got an MFA. And it's like, man, are you kidding me? I got to do this three times in a matter of like 90 seconds just to get access into the office. I hate it. It's a pain. But at the end of the day, it's the right thing to do. So, you know, stop allowing the tail to wag the dog and just move forward with it. All right, so Corey, let's go ahead and talk about some of the new live features in our MDR. Okay, so live features in MDR. Uh, we have what's called ransomware defense. So what the heck does that mean? Now, keep in mind, this only applies if you're on our MDR offering. 
So we now have the ability to monitor for ransomware actively occurring on the endpoint. Now, if we identify this, then we can take immediate response as far as an isolation is concerned. And then we can also have the ability to uh, kill the processes that are making this occur. Now, coming in the future, what we'll also have the ability to do is if, for example, an isolation doesn't work, we'll have the ability to immediately shut that endpoint down to help prevent any further spread, right? The, the infection is already happening. The ransomware is already occurring. So what we need to do is we need to isolate it and get it off the network and stop any further destruction that's occurring. This is different compared to uh, other methods that we see other organizations using. So there's plenty of organizations that do ransomware you know, protection. Uh, most of them, what they'll do is they'll use what's called canaries. They will take a, sing, you know, take a file, they'll put it somewhere hidden on the endpoint, I can tell you it's usually in the My Documents directory, and they'll monitor activity of that file. And if they see any changes to that file, they will consider that a potential ransomware event and then take either alerts you or if you turn on response, cool, they'll do something. The problem, in my opinion, with canaries is it's too static. I've, I've seen many end users. I did it the first time I noticed the file because the file was listed as a bunch of different random letters. And I was like, what the heck is this? And you know, they delete it. And then boom, now you triggered a ransomware response. Um, so leveraging a static file for ransomware detection is better than nothing by any means. Um, but there's a lot better methods, a lot better technology out there to do this. And so we have the ability to actually fully monitor behavior on the endpoint to detect if ransomware is occurring. Uh, in line with that as well, we have now, as someone mentioned earlier, uh, we have the ability now with our offering to manage Windows Defender. Now, I've gotten this question a lot in the last couple of months of, do you guys recommend running Windows Defender side by side with Silence? Uh, my simple answer is yes and no. That doesn't right? sound simple at all. It's simple. It's it's totally it's, not, it's, it's, not it's totally it's totally it's totally up to your business needs and what you want to do. The downside I see to running Windows Defender and Silent side by side is that if you're troubleshooting something that's going on in the endpoint, now you have two different pieces of software, two different antiviruses. You got to figure out what's causing this issue. If you are fine with that, then you start receiving a lot of benefits. Windows Defender has come a long way. If you told me you're using Windows Defender 10 years ago, I'd say you're crazy. Nice to meet you. Goodbye. And you just um, said but, it two years ago, I'd have called you crazy. Yeah. I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> and, and, but it's really come a long way. Windows it Defender has. does a really good job on convicting files or behaviors that are associated with Windows that they are aware of. And that's the key term that they're aware of. Um, and so I, I'm... My machine here, I'm running Silence and Defender side by side. Now that's mainly because I have to support this and test this, but I've seen some benefits. Now, mm -hmm. another issue that we ran into was as soon as server 2016 came out in 2019 and 2022, Microsoft stopped disabling Windows Defender when you install another antivirus. So uh, the problem with that is, okay, if Windows Defender grabs something before Silence can grab it, my SOC doesn't know about it. So we're in the blind. And that could have been an indicator that a potential compromise is occurring in the environment. And so we've been working directly with InfoSlite slash Dato EDR um, about a year now to, to really hone in the ability for us, our SOC, that if our partners choose to run our MDR offering and choose to run Windows Defender side by side, we need to be able to see those alerts. We need to see what's happening within Windows Defender. And then now also importantly is we need to make sure that the proper settings for Windows Defender are in place and that the proper exclusion so that Silence and Windows Defender aren't conflicting with each other in place. We can now do that all from the MDR portal. It used to be that the Microsoft operating system would disable Windows Defender when it recognized another antivirus that it wanted to legitimately say, okay, we get it. Um, it's not happening anymore. And some of the newer operating systems we're seeing Windows Defender is staying on regardless of putting Sentinel One, CrowdStrike, Silence, or anything else in place. Um, so 
Richard, one thing we're talking about MDR for so for some of you that maybe have been around with us for a hot minute when we only had our tier three offering and this would have been going back to at least 2021. Um, we started our MDR offering in probably late 2021 and got really hot and just led with it in 2022. But uh, we are talking about our MDR offering, which takes what used to be our active ready response passive agent and now turns it on to a real time scanning engine with all of the MITRE attack rules that we've built along to go with that. Um, so Datto is the Datto EDR is part of our MDR offering and it is now included in that MDR offering as well. If you're not familiar, don't let the term, the Datto term confuse you, right? Like you don't have to have Datto. You don't have to be a Datto partner. You don't have to use their RMM or any other product they have. Since Infosight was acquired by Datto, it's officially called Datto EDR. If you right. talk to me, I, I still call it Infosight, just like I'll, I don't call Silence Blackberry, I call it Silence. Um, and so that is that is the, the tool set that we're using with our MDR offer. All right, let's get us moving along. Here we go. So some upcoming MDR features. What do we got, Corey? All right, so upcoming features is, um, I, I kind of talked about this earlier during the introduction. Uh, we are making some improvements to our XDR slash SIM. Um, so one, we're trying to improve how you access it, make it easier for you to access, faster load times, better reporting. I know that's the key thing a lot of people have been asking for is better reporting. Um, and so that's something that we're actively focusing on and getting to starting with this, uh, I'll call it big migration uh, to uh, a better architecture, I'll say of it, to help in increase the speed so that your experience is a lot better, especially around these reporting. Um, unprotected device discovery. So uh, it will have the ability to, if you wanna run a scan to see which machines are not protected with the Silence agent as an example, uh, that feature is coming. You'll also be able to see in the portal a full application inventory to help kind of centralize things and bring things in for you. Uh, script control enhancements is something I've really been looking forward to and, and speaking with Silence about. The ability to monitor and analyze more script types, you know, so we got .NET coming out, Python, uh, JavaScript, and then probably the most important thing for me that's coming is a better accountability for PowerShell console familiar with it right now it's an on off feature there's no way to make exclusions to one liners within powershell console that is coming this year uh, unfortunately i can't remember if that's q1 or q2 but that's something that's definitely coming this year that i'm super excited about uh enhanced reporting uh so we're gonna get better report <laughs> again reporting 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 um you know just to be blunt because we're all friends here right um you know there's, there's are, you, are you just going to say our reporting sucks? Is there's, that what no, you're well, there, say? there's there's a line in the sand, right? Where some people want the pretty reporting that does not provide a lot of useful information. Not naming any names, um, and there's a lot of vendors out there that they their reports look beautiful, but then you hand it to someone like me, and I'm like, what the heck am I looking at? This tells me absolutely nothing. Okay, I have this many <laughs> endpoints installed. Okay, you looked at this many, but what happened? What is this? What do I need to account for here? Um, and so we're trying to find that happy medium. I can, I can definitely give you data right now, um, but we're trying to find that happy medium with making it look pretty enough that you can go to your customers, have a one pager, slap it down, say, hey, here's something, um, and, and for it to be useful. So we're, again, heavily focusing on that. That's a huge pain point for a lot of our partners that we're trying to improve. Um, enhanced threat feeds. And so that's the ability to pull in more threat feeds from more sources to account for the newest vulnerabilities or latest threats that are coming out, right? When it comes to security, I mean, that's really where you, what you have to do. Because there's new things coming up. <laughs> I'll say on a, you know, every minute, there's something new that's coming out that you have to account for and be looking at. One specific question, and this is one that I think has been asked to us a couple of times, and I'll, I'll give my answer and I'll let Corey give his. It's like the intent to integrate silence optics into MDR and curious as to why we chose InfoSight and recognizing they're not apples to apples. Um, we struggled, you know, silence struggled. They were doing all of their indexing on the machines, which caused a crazy drag on the machines. Anything that was older optics just became a non-go. 
So we couldn't even do anything with it. So as we were doing more incident response work and compromise assessments, and we started to see the power of what we were getting out of InfoSight and their willingness to work with us to build this really powerful EDR tool that was exactly the way we wanted it with the ability for us to control it in ways that were meaningful so that we could do things when threats were starting to escalate so that we could then take a more proactive approach. Um, that was one of the biggest reasons I would say from the business aspect of it. Corey, I'll let you go ahead and put your, your two cents into this one. Yeah, I mean, it's nail on the head there. So, you know, you'll, you'll hear me say a lot static and dynamic. Optics is a decent EDR solution. Uh, we've had our pain points for the last seven, eight years, whatever it was, uh, with processing power, as you said, the amount that's mm -hmm. required for it. Now, we, it really took a head when, you know, Silence, their primary product is their AV. Their secondary product is the EDR. And so for us to be successful, we needed a collection of tools that make us the most successful. And so that's why we landed on InfoSight because that is their primary. That is what they do. And then the collaboration that we have with InfoSight, and even now that it's Dato EDR, that we still maintain that collaboration, that when new threats come out, we are actively working to add new rules, to add new YAR rules, right? New detections. What can we do to account for this, as an example? I'm talking with them about the uh, detection of our mem tools. We already have a detection right now if uh, Screen Connect's installed, as an example, yep. right? So um, the amount of collaboration that we have to make the EDR that's part of our MDR offering uh, more advanced is what we're getting. now. Corey and your team, I mean, Corey and his team are heavily influencing the direction of where it's going. I mean, there is some really pretty reporting that's about to happen within Dato EDR. Um, and this goes to Preston's comment. It's like, we have been just beating them about the head and neck for about a year now. Um, and it's been rough because right before the acquisition of InfoSight to Dato in January of 22, it was on the roadmap, it was coming. And then it got distracted. Things started to go a little bit of a different direction, um, but it's back up. We've seen the mock-ups of it. It does look nice. It does read well. And so, yes. Um, and one of the things that we've asked for is we've asked for that branding capability because they've got Datto smashed all over the report. And I asked for them to change it powered by Datto EDR so that there could be some branding in place. So hopefully, Preston, you're going to be happy when you finally see it. It's not going to be perfect, but we think coming out of the gates exactly what what most partners are looking for today. Yeah, and for Cliff, if you are on our tier three, Silence tier three offering, if you are, if anybody's unsure what offering you're taking advantage of through us, speak with your camp, right? Or email me or email Corey or just, you know, we'll figure, we'll figure it out. We'll let you know. Yeah, we'll if you're using you. tier three, Optics is your primary EDR because that is what's performing real-time scanning. If you would like to step it up to a more advanced MDR that's more heavily focused around MITRE, which is the direction we're going and we've been going, then that's where the MDR offering steps in and turns that InfoSight agent into real-time scanning. But if you're tier three, you need optics because that is your EDR. You mm -hmm. are installing the InfoSight agent, but that InfoSight agent is in a passive mode and only used by our SOC in the event that additional scanning or isolations or something needs to occur. All right, let's talk about some changes and improvements that have been happening in the stock here at Solutions Granted. And I do want to remind everybody, because it seems like this question comes up a lot, and even though I say it probably 8,000 times a year, our SOC is our people. We don't outsource. We don't overseas. If you talk to somebody in Solutions Granted, 100% guaranteed they are here in the continental United States. 100% guaranteed they are an employee to solutions granted. They are not going to be working overseas. They will not be some contract organization. They are our people doing it our way. So, Corey, let's talk about some of the improvements and things that you're doing over there. So, growth, growth of our SOC, right? And that's something every organization needs to do and something we've been working on. And we're going to keep. <laughs> Keep running with it in 2023. Uh, you know, when we first started our own SOC, we always had a blue team for a while. 
So if, you, if you're not familiar with the terminology, blue team are your defenders. Those are the ones that are actively monitoring threats, responding to alerts, sending you emails, stuff like that. Uh, and so we, we got to a position where I needed to add an additional team. One, I needed to add an escalation point for my blue team members. Two, I needed, I needed individuals that are really, really good at threat hunting. That instead of sitting there responding to all these alerts that are coming in, they can actually be in the weeds, focused on active threat hunting, finding the, you know, the indicators of compromise that we can't automate, can't just pop up. Uh, they're charged with, so it's not just me doing it, right? Where can we improve? Right. And that's something I challenge my purple team with all the time of, okay, what's our gaps? Where can we help improve? Right. How can we modify these rules to detect more things more accurately? And so now you might hear sometimes when you talk to us, or you're talking to an individual of our SOC where they might indicate that they're a purple team member, as an example. Um, as I indicated earlier, we are heavily focused on the MITRE attack framework. If you're not familiar with it, it's a framework, it's a community as well. Uh, that focuses on you know, what are adversaries actively doing out there? How can we detect it? And how can we defend against it? You might see a bunch of different, you know, Miner's actually taken off a lot, I've noticed in the last two years as well, especially with their evaluations, their reporting, stuff like that. Um, and so all of my, you know, by the end of 2023, my goal is to have every single one of my SOC analysts be officially Miner Attack Defender certified, which is their official, super long, super fun um, certification process as well. Let's see. Oh, Mr. Dirty Llama, Will Alexander. Tell me, tell me, tell me, sir, what do we got going on here? So, Evo, yeah, um, a lot of you are familiar with it and have had a, a taste, especially if you've used our, uh, our new partner portal. More news to come uh, for that as well. Um, so we put together some stats uh, from a couple different vendors that we use. Um, Silent, Sonic, Wall, Avanon, Evo, and we kind of mashed them all together to get kind of a, a general idea of what's happened since COVID. And the reason that we did that is because COVID has brought tremendous opportunity for both small businesses, um, you know, people starting businesses, working from home, tremendous opportunities for all kinds of things, um, but also the bad guys. Um, ransomware and social engineering have estimated, um, they say 600% growth. You know, uh, I don't know if I believe that much. That's but a big number. It's a big number. Um, you know, and they're saying 90% of that, um, of those attacks, of those um, ransomware infections, of those social engineer cases, they're saying about 90% of them are either because of login breaches or something simple like patching. Oh, wait a second. Will, did you just use the B word? Come on, man. You know we're not allowed to use that word. Sorry. Um, no, no, no B words. Compromise. Yeah, that thing. Whatever. <laughs> um, no patches. Um, Weak passwords, no MFA, some kind of social engineering attack, right? 90%. Um, over 50% are small businesses. Um, the average payout of a ransomware attack or incident um, has gone, so they say, from about 10K to a little over $240,000 um, per payout on average. Um, so it's a lot. The reason we thought those statistics were important is because we hear a lot, and Corey said it earlier, is our biggest challenge is I'm too small. Why would I need all of this advanced? Why do I need MFA? The simple, most basic thing you can turn on on pretty much any online account, but why do I need this? I'm too small, nobody cares about me. I wish that was still the case. It's not about that. Um, criminals are not just kids in their mom's basements anymore. Some are, um, but for the most part, uh, Corey looks like he's in his mom's face. <laughs> Mom, I need some pop tarts. <laughs> Bagel bites. Um, but for the most part, criminals are smart. Um, criminals have made billions and billions of dollars. Um, there are multiple ransomware as a service sites out there. So I read. Um, there are multiple social engineering as a service campaigns you can buy that will be run for you. Um, it's not it's not the dumb criminals that we're used to in the past. Uh, so it's not really about how small you are anymore. It's 
they know how much you're willing to pay as a small company. So they don't really care how small you are. They care about what you're willing to pay to get back what they're holding hostage. And if you're a small company, you don't have backups. That's your only source of your data. That's you know what you're counting on for your retirement, your kids' well-being, their future. You're probably willing to pay a pretty penny to get your life back. So unfortunately, it's what you know that train of thought or that mentality isn't. Uh, yeah, it's gone with the wind. So. MFA specifically, um, Evo Security, uh, again, as many of you know, we've made a choice to partner with them. Uh, we have been partnering and working with them for actually uh, probably about two years now. Um, I sit on their uh, two of their advisory boards, um, and they are a great company to work with. They were interested in building their MSSP offering, um, and we have been helping them uh, with that and strengthen their offerings and their products and uh you know some of the problems they solve especially when you're talking to a lot of smb companies is um multiple products so you have mfa you have identity management you have uh third party you know temporary one-time password keys you have sso and saml integrations um all these different things not to mention your identity um man or yeah access management um you know, your identity verification. Uh, when it came to doing all of that for us in the past, we had multiple different products we were using. Mm -hmm. uh, last pass, we had Duo. Um, you know, we were looking at Okta. And it, it's not great when you're spread so thin. So that's a problem. Um, a lot of products that we found, especially with one of the big ones that was in the news recently, you can probably read between the lines, um, aren't great at keeping data safe. Um, they are not true zero trust out of the box. Uh, they don't support multi-tenancy. Um, they suck at providing a solution for shared authentication. Um, and they don't have integrations with a lot of the products we need as an MSSP to support our partners. So all of those problems are fixed by Evo. Um, they can do it all. So they are true zero trust out of the box. Uh, they handle MFA, um, any integrations with SSO, SAML, um, they will do uh, true multi-tenancy and everything is in separate containers, um, shared controlled access and authentication. So your uh, engineers or your analysts or, you know, whoever employees are not just sharing a password that they have saved and insert password manager name here, um, but actually providing a way of tracking who uses it, um, verifying that person is allowed to use it, verifying that person is who they say they are before they can use it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, of course, they support all the hard key um, that most of the other managers do. Um, and then for us, just the amount of things we can integrate them into. So not just Windows login, but also, you know, ConnectWise, Avic, Datto, um, Scout, you know, um, ScalePad, Command, like, you know, a lot of the true MSP products um, and then keeping everything in one place. Um, so the biggest Phil question is, yep. And here it is the biggest question. So, you know, we had our crystal ball on the front page. You know, we're talking about looking into 23 and, you know, we do have the coming soon. So just everybody understand it is not quite ready. So Will, looking into your crystal ball and hopefully your ESPN isn't broken today. Tell me. Where do you think we're going with this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so like I said before, we've been using it in-house uh, for the better part of two years. Um, for the last couple of months, we have been all in with them to help them develop their product at a MSSP level. Um, as all of you guys know, we're not just at that MSP level or that MSSP level, but we have to provide solutions that uh, our partners can use and effectively manage their customers. So there's another level that a lot of companies just aren't prepared for or built for. So that's what we're fine tuning. Um, so their MSSP offering, um, we're wrapping up their Windows credential provider. So one of the biggest, um, I think, coolest parts of MFA is integrating it into your, your PCs, your servers, um, because that's something a lot of people overlook. We did for a long time. Um, you know, being able to get that prompt when you log into your PC or if you need to install a piece of software, getting a prompt at that elevated um, 
prompt, you know, in Windows to actually, you know, verify that you can use your admin account or sys account, whatever you call it. So those are some things we're finalizing with them right now. Um, they have told me um, they're about a month away. So I would hope and am on them daily and on calls daily trying to get everything that we want to work work uh, before we make this live for partners because obviously if we're not happy with it and it doesn't work for us we're not going to offer it to you guys and risk you guys running into the same problems we are so that is my goal um, and hopefully they're able to deliver on that right on we have now integrated it and i'm going back to my frank's red hots we have put that shit on everything i mean literally everything we can put it on it now exists um, and yes, there's some mighty little glitches and, you know, hiccups here or there, but for the most part, it is a really good functioning solution that seems to be giving us exactly what we were looking for. Yep. All right, let's continue to move on. Uh, let's see, cloud and email security enhancements. So Mr. Clark, Mr. Will, Alexander, just so you guys know, we've only got seven minutes and I want to be, you know, respectful of everybody's time. So we're going to move just a little bit quicker to make sure we can get this done to get the final things in there we know are important for you guys as well. Um, you know, let's talk about one really big thing. I know it's last on our list, but for a year, we have heard from all of our partners, we need archiving, we need archiving, we need archiving. I can't give up my archiving with Proofpoint, or I can't give up my archiving with, you know, Mimecast. Why can't Avanon do it? Well, archiving is here. So for all of you that have said, I need it, I have to have it, please get it to me. We've got it. It's reasonably priced. I'm going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to say, oh man, I hope I'm not wrong, but I think it's $1.50 per mailbox per month is what I think it is. I reserve the right to change my mind because my CFO will do it for me in case I'm wrong. And I hope I'm not, but I think that's about where we're at. Um, the enhanced URL rewriting. Um, rewriting inside of the attachments. That's a really big one. That was a huge security enhancement that we were really happy to see that they came out with. Um, what else? Corey, Will, these other two things in here? Yeah, it's just showing enhancements that um, Avanon, say the name, I've been working on, right? So Avanon's been our primary email security offering uh, that a lot of our partners have been very happy with. Because uh, just the ease of use, right? How quick it is to set up doesn't require the amount of administration that goes into gateways and still provides that t that high level of security. Yep. And so they're not just sitting on their hands. They're adding more and more features or enhancing what they currently have. So they're already good URL rewriting, making sure we're inside of attachments, looking for malicious URLs inside of there. If other organizations are getting hit and, you know, suppliers as an example and coming down to you, we can detect that. Uh, and then looking for misconfigurations within an environment, adding tools for such things. So uh, a lot of great things coming out of that offering. Um, one quick question. Avanon does not plan on doing any on-prem. They were cloud built for cloud with their APIs. They are doing it with 365 and Google Workspace. So no, that one will not be happening. Um, I wanted to dispel one myth that I get tired of hearing from other vendors out there. Um, it talks about the only way to truly protect your house is to have a gateway technology. Well, that might be true for 99% of the API space out there, not true for Avanon. Avanon has intellectual property and patents on pre-delivery. They are not doing post-delivery and then pulling it back. So while they say the gateway is the only way to stop everything, not a true statement, don't be fooled. When somebody says that, that does not exist when it comes to Avanon. Um, Eric, I'm sorry that you've got two clients that are refusing to change You know, my advice to you as you've got a couple options. You can go to Mail Protector. They do a really great job with on-prem exchange. Um, you could also go to Proofpoint. You could also go to Mimecast. If I was going to put my money in it and I had an on-prem exchange, I'd probably go to Mail Protector if it was me. Um, but there, I mean, and I'm not trying to leave out anybody, but that's the two at the moment. Um, yeah. And Barracuda, sorry, Eric, didn't mean to leave them out because I know that they're a huge player in the space. One of our fastest growing offerings in 2022, 
Um, so I keep getting questions about response. I'm waiting on additional development for us to turn on respond slash response, which gives us the ability to enable customized alerts. A lot of our partners, they look at things differently. They want alerts on certain things. Uh, so once that is in place for us, which is supposed to be this quarter as soon as possible, so hopefully within the next month, uh, we'll be able to turn that on and do more customized alerts and uh, responses to compromises that we're identifying. Um, they're working on enhancements to what they currently have as well. So example with geo uh, geolocation, which is a bane of my existence in most offerings because no one does it really, really good because there's so many data databases out there. Am I in Colorado or am I in Virginia? Who knows? Um, so they're doing significant improvements uh, on their geolocation geo identification. Say that three times fast. Um, and then working more with uh, integrations as well. So we're going to see more platforms that are going to be added um, this year uh, to, to account for that. Right on. As we're coming close here, um, you guys, we've seen, Will, we've got couple hundred partners that have registered for our new partner portal. We wanted to make it easy. This is not malware. There's no redirected nonsense. We're going to put you to here. If you're looking for an easy way to get set up with our partner portal so that you can get the announcements, the news, the best practices, the sales and marketing, the technical documents, please take out your phone, scan the QR code, send us an email. Let us know we need your first and last name and we need your email address. We would love to get you set up in our portal so that we can communicate with you more effectively and give you a lot more of the information that we're building in this portal for you today. Only location you'll get any of our public facing documentation yep. from any of our offerings. So I know everybody has seen this in the past that have seen us do a webinar or seen me present anywhere along the way. We've made one change. You know, what's it gonna take to be successful in 2023? MFA, stop asking, start demanding. Patch management, trust but verify. This is where vulnerability management comes into play. That conditional access, we talked about it and what you need, and we talked about some of that licensing. Thank you for everybody that put that in there and what conditional access looks like when it comes to 365. Having a password manager, um, no open RDP. I mean, I swear every time we talk to anybody, it's like the duh, of course there's no open RDP, but man, I can't tell you how many compromises we found in 2022 where people are looking for us to help and there's open RDP. Um, I believe MDR is an absolute essential must for everybody to be successful in 2023. You know, it's, it's a managed EDR, it's a 24 seven stock, it's threat hunters, it's people looking for that anomalistic behavior in the middle of the night at 2 a.m. on a Tuesday to take evasive action to make sure that the house doesn't burn down. MDR is not a nice to have, it's not a want to have, it's a must have. It goes hand in hand with MFA. I don't think you're gonna be successful in 2023 at the end of the day, if you're not putting both of them in place and mandating it. Um, we always try to funnel, funnel this with, how do I start my journey? Here's another opportunity. If you'd like more information on anything that we said, if we said something that was confusing and you'd like more clarity, please send an email, pull out your phones, send us the information. We'd love to talk to you, you know, whatever it may be. Um, look, everybody, I really greatly appreciate your time. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. You know, we're not here without you. Our partners make us what we are today. Thank you very much. We really look forward to a successful 23 for all of us. Any comments, any questions, any concerns, anything that we can do to make our offerings better, please let me know. Please talk to the team. Talk to Corey, talk to Will, talk to me. And I hope everybody has an amazing rest of the day and you know, close out January of 2023 and the remaining hours that you have strong. Everyone take care and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Royal rules.